Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore the nature of time. My guest is Gary Lockman, formerly a songwriter and bass guitarist for the rock band Blondie. He is one of the world's foremost historians of esoteric culture. He has been interviewed a dozen times previously on New Thinking Aloud on topics ranging from Rudolf Steiner, Madame Blavatsky, Emanuel Swedenborg, P.D. Uspensky, Colin Wilson, Alistair Crowley, Hermeticism, Carl Jung, Chaos Magic, and Russian Mysticism. His newest book is Dreaming Ahead of Time, Experiences with Precognitive Dreams, Synchronicity, and Coincidence. Gary lives in London, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Gary. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you again, Jeffrey, as always. We talked about precognitive dreams in our previous interview and your fascinating book, uh, Dreaming Ahead of Time. But what we left out of our discussion then was a deep exploration that you've done, not that it's going to result in any final conclusions about the nature of time itself. So that's where we're going to pick up today. And I think maybe a good place to start is, is with Newton, because most people, I think, intuitively have a, a sort of Newtonian sense of space and time. Oh, well, that's what we considered to be one of the basic elements of the modern world, uh, this notion of um, Newtonian time. And um, I, I realize in some interviews when I've talked about this, I, I, I say TikTok time. And I realize now that people must think I'm talking about the social media app, which I'm not. I'm talking about the you know, the second hand on the clock. So if I, if I do say that, that's what I'm talking about. So um, in any case, but yes, I mean, um, I mean, Isaac Newton, you know, one of, you know, discovered gravity and, and um, uh, you know, founder Descartes and others of the, you know, Cartesian Newtonian um, world. But he, I should say, not so much invented, but he came to the, these conclusions about the nature of time that have since, you know, we just accept, as you say, we just accept as, as kind of given. Um, although they're not really as given as, as we, we, we would think. Um, but but what are they? Well, it's this notion of time flowing, this this equable flow, a constant flow of time. There is this something, which we're not quite sure exactly what it is, because it's not made of anything. It's not material. Um, it, it's not a medium in the sense of kind of like the ether or something, or although we do think of it as something that flows in some way and it has a direction. Um, and we call it time. And, uh, okay, you know, five minutes ago, we weren't doing this. That's the past. You know, five minutes into this, this will, well, actually, oh, no, whoa, whoa, there you go. It was the past, it's the past already now. <laughs> so we have this thing called the present that we occupy for an un unquantifiable amount of time because it doesn't stay in, in in any one place as it were and we have a language this is the only way we can talk about time really we have a language that talks about it as it moving and flowing and all that but one of the things i say in the book <clears throat> is that you know if time is a river and newton wasn't the one who really brought this on he quantified it he made it official and he basically said this is what's happening there's you know this this kind of absolute time out there that it, it it's always constantly moving at the same pace, we can say. So it isn't the case. He didn't know about black holes. And of course, you know, we're, we're sophisticated um, in a way uh, about astrophysics that he wasn't. But in any case, in general, it isn't the case that somewhere out in the galaxy, an hour is shorter than it is here or whatever, or a minute is longer than it is here. It Time flows in this 
irrevocable direction from what we call the past through the present into the future. Or if you look at it the other way, <laughs> it comes towards us from the future to the present into the past. So it depends which way you're looking at the river, as it were. Okay. And all our clocks, you know, I mean, oh, there were clocks before Newton, obviously, but it kind of like what became something that, let us say, that was um, applied to time mechanisms, to, you know, timekeeping devices. And I say in the book that for the longest time, as it were, the only timekeeping, you know, uh, the timekeeping device anyone needed was the earth itself or the sky. You know, you have the sun came up, it went down. You know, you have a month, the, the, a moon gives us a month, you know, but there's no such thing as a week. And let, you just kind of cut, you know, the moon's phases up. Um, we have a day, but we don't really have an hour. I mean, I, I, I have one, can I tell one bad joke? You know, God, 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 God worked really hard when he was creating the universe, but after 24 hours, he called it a day. That's, <laughs> that's my bad joke about, about that. But I'm saying it's like we have a day because the sun goes up and goes down. Or actually, it doesn't. You know, the earth turns. Uh, it doesn't really go up or go down. The, the earth turns and all that. But we have this notion of time being this thing, this kind of flow, this kind of current that is always moving in that direction and, and irrevocably takes us, you know, towards the future. And the thing is, what, what gives us that impression um, of this flow is that processes, process takes place. Processes take place. You know, plants, you know, put in the ground, they sprout, they grow, they give forth, you know, flowers and fruit and so on. They die. Human beings are born, grow, mature with any luck and then die and so on and so on. So living things have this kind of organic or organic things have this process. Um, but if you took away this notion of process in some way, if things didn't move, didn't do anything, and you just had a completely static universe or a static world, you wouldn't have a notion of time. And this is, you know, one of the early, this is, still remains the kind of the, I guess Jung would say the archetype of perfection, that this kind of static, you know, notion of unchanging perfection. The perfect, by definition, must be unchanging because it already has all perfection and doesn't need anything, so it has no need to alter itself. And this will go back to the very beginning of, you know, uh, Western philosophy with uh, Parmenides, who argues that per perfection, the one, is unchanging, so time is an illusion. What we see is motion and change is an illusion. And Heraclitus is saying, no, you know, it's the exact opposite. There, there, nothing remains the same. It's constant kind of change. There's a logos, there's a reason through the change, but, the, but you know, you never step in the same river twice, you know, that kind of thing. And Plato believed he reached a compromise with this very poetic phrase where eternity is in love with the productions of time. So it's a kind of relation between two. But we're still stuck in that, that, that kind of, you know, relationship. How, how do we equate those two things? But getting back to Newton, Newton sort of quantified it, and this is the way that we've all of us have grown up with that. All of us have grown up with clocks and, and, and more and more with you know, contemporary times. We, we don't even have the old clock that gave us even a sense of the past and the future. We have just the digital thing, which is just now. Now, now. You know, so um, our, our conception of time, even even it's changed even now in, in recent years, even though for the most most time, modern time, we've been under a Newtonian notion, but it's, it's actually changed quite a bit recently. Is it the case that Newton's vision of time, which became so dominant around the world, also occurred simultaneously with the development of accurate clocks? Well, I mean, they went hand in hand, as it were. You I mean, you had timekeeping devices earlier. You had is that what is that the clepestrida, if I'm pronouncing it, you know, correctly, this water kind of clock. Um, so again, a process, something's taking place, or the you know the hourglass, the sand, uh, kind of thing. And then um, I forget exactly what is it the 15th century, is it the 1400s or the 14th century in Czechoslovakia and Prague, Central Europe? You you start to have these clocks that are you know erected or part of the main center of town um and they begin to regulate oral activity strangely enough i mean the regulation of time goes back to the monasteries 
because the monks needed to, you know, know when to do this, when to go do that, when to do that. So they had, you know, various devices in order to do that. And one of the things I point out, I don't know if it's that book or another one where I say it's an odd thing because initially this, this kind of alarm clock, as it were, to keep you aware of the different times so that you can get on with your different duties, uh, in order to facilitate a spiritual life is kind of <laughs> overcome that where now we're just kind of completely uh, enslaved to finer and finer, you know, slices of different time or saving time or, you know, all this kind of thing. And the spiritual side of us gets kind of lost in that, I would say. Well, another Western vision of time, which would be very different, I think, from that of Newton, would be the notion of Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, that uh, time is, if I th understand it right, is, is basically created by the mind itself. Yes, but I mean, that wouldn't necessarily mean that Kant was, was disagreeing with Newton. Actually, Kant came up with his, um, he wanted to save Newton in a certain sense. Um, Kant was wakened from his dogmatic slumbers um, by the skepticism of uh, David David Hume, um, a, a Scotch a Scottish um, philosopher, a brilliant um, fellow, but he was a skeptic. And there's the whole back, as they say, backstory, a whole history uh, to this, where you start with Descartes, who's trying to arrive at some 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 rock solid bedrock certainty from which he can build the foundations uh, set the foundations of knowledge he can he can you know build build knowledge and that in a way starts this kind of wildfire through western philosophy where the the, the very pursuit of certainty leads to smaller and smaller kind of little fragments of things you can be certain about and um it finally long story short through Locke and barclay bishop barclay it gets to david hume and says like you know well we talk about cause and effect we talk about all this kind of thing but actually th 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 it's all habit it's a habit of our mind to see things in that way um there, it, there there's no real reason why when you know one thing hits another thing that it should do what we say it should do there's no real reason why when i put a kettle on the boil it actually boils it might freeze you know one day it may one day the sun may not come up. We just assume all of these things are going to happen, but there's no actual compelling kind of, you know, recognizable force outside of a psychological habit to sort of do this. And this was sort of, everyone was like, whoa, my God, what happened? And you, Kant, who, you know, he said he was walking from his dogmatic slumbers, he had to come to the defense of cause and effect and by proxy, the defense of Newton and all that. So Kant said, that, hold on, you know, time and space and a variety of other things are categories by which we understand can make sense of our experience, make sense of the world. So in a way, we, we, they're kind of stencils. You might say that we put on raw experience out there so we can organize it in a way that you know, we, can, we can make sense about this. So in a way, yeah, you're right. He's saying like, it's all in the mind, but it's we 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 recognize that we project onto the raw experience this these necessities, what he calls these 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 categories. They're 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 absolutely without these we would not have any kind of experience whatsoever. So I say in the book, you you can't possibly think of anything that w without some sense of space. Okay, even if you have just blank like behind you the dark you know black curtain, if you had that completely black and solid, I couldn't even see any of the folds in it, it would still seem to occupy some kind of space for me. Just as I can't conceive of anything not being in process, not, not going on like that. So these, these are fundamental categories, just like my glasses. If I took these off, so I wouldn't be able to see anything. So for Kant, they're like that. So he felt that he, he saved cause and effect, but it was sort of we can we can never know what it's really like on the other side of the spectacles, right? I can only see a world when I have the spectacles on. If I take them off, I can't see anything. So I can never know what the world looks like when I'm not wearing my spectacles. So that caused a whole lot of other problems. <laughs> and it also gave lots of philosophers after Kant work to do. But that was sort of the thing. So but so time for Kant was something that yeah, Newton was able to as we say, map it out into the objective world and, and, and show it as, um, how should we say, a kind of, um, what do you want to say? You have like the Cartesian, you know, 
algebraic grid where there's you know the the uh, the coordinates all right so on that there's two coordinates that way and that way but in actual our experience there's three there's that way that way and when <laughs> you know meet me at the corner of 25th and main street when Okay, so we have to put time into it. So that's for any kind of real experience to take place. We need something like time and, and space as well. That's saying for us to experience anything, we can only experience it in some kind of context, some kind of temporal context. But does that mean there is a, a thing, a stuff called time, which, I, you know, it's out there flowing and I can go put my finger into it? Because if you think about time as a river, where are its banks? We can't conceive of a river without there being banks to it. No matter how wide the river might be, we know there are many, many mighty wide rivers, but no matter how wide that river may be, there's a bank on one side, there's a bank on the other side. If you don't have that, you just have endless, endless, endless. And we, we can't conceive of that. Neither, if you want to have the other, that, that's the stream of time. If you want to have the other, the chariot, Marvel's chariot, or well, the chariots roll on pavements, they roll on roads, and there are you know, sides to the roads. <laughs> So where are the pavements? So that, that's the kind of thing. These are metaphors that were kind of captured by, but when you think about them, they, they, they don't hold up. Another view of time, which I think is becoming more and more popular, more dominant, maybe not the dominant view yet, but is derived from Einstein, who referred to time as a persistently stubborn illusion. <laughs> yeah, but even Einstein had to set his alarm clock. Yeah. Einstein said, if, if like me, you understand physics, um, you will know that past, present, future are, are, are an illusion. Uh, and Fred Hoyle, uh, the, the scientist who coined the phrase the Big Bang, even though he didn't agree with it. And apparently these days, it's actually becoming more and more under, under question. So maybe Hoyle will be pulled out and, and, and seem to be right about some things. Um, but uh, he too said that, no, it's an illusion. And this is the whole thing. It's, yeah, because the According to physics, the processes taking place could take place whether they go this way or that way in time. Um, but I said, but even Einstein, even Fred Hoyle, they had to set their alarm clocks, you know. And, and so it is a very persistent illusion. And But I don't know. I mean, this is the thing. It's uh, Well, there was a famous debate between um, Einstein and Bergson, Henri Bergson, who's a French philosopher who wrote a great deal about time. He, in fact, kind of brought the time question back into um, popularity, as it were, or, or made it significant again in early books like Time and Free Will. Um, and he was an evolutionist, but not a Darwinian evolution. He was a creative evolutionist. He believed in something he called the Elan Vital. It's like the life, there was this kind of life surging force that was pushing into matter and, and organizing it. So it had a kind of teleology, not, not so much a teleology where it had, it was a something already planned like an acorn, but it had an urge, a creative surge and this kind of thing. But he talked about duration, which is our inner experience of time and not tick-tock Newtonian time, which is quantified time. It's like, you know, um, and you know, you know, uh, <laughs> there's the old, even Einstein, I think, he, there's an old joke about Einstein, time is relative, and he said, yes, you know, a pretty lady sitting on your knee for <laughs> 30 seconds seems <laughs> forever, or, or, or whatever, you know, whatever, or, 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 you know, waiting in the dentist's office, you know, for, you know, seems, you know what I'm saying? There's like, de depending on the situation, you either, the time seems to drag, or it goes by to, if you're having fun, you know, all that kind of thing. So that's our experience of time, which is duration. And Bergson and Einstein had a famous debate about that. But in the end, Einstein sort of sort of won out. But, you know, I, I think, you know, even people kind of the popular notion of relativity is something different than what Einstein actually talked about. I've interviewed uh, Bernardo Castrop, a philosopher who accepts what uh, is known as the block universe based on Einstein's theory of general relativity. In, and in the block universe, well, you could say time is like an ocean and that all time from the beginning of time till the end of time, it all exists actually in the now moment. Yeah, I mean, that's that's uh, Minkowski, uh, Jorgen Minkowski, who was... Um, one of Einstein's teachers, actually. And yeah, there's this notion that, yeah, like I said, our 
it's an illusion where this process is taking place. Is that it's all happening in one kind of huge block kind of thing? Or, but again, a block. You know, there's edges on a block, right? It's like you get to the end end of the block, as it were, and woo, you fall off. And it's another. So what's what's what what's what's at, what's at the end of the block? Um, and well, one of the people I talk about in my book, who is a time haunted man, who's also deeply interested in dreams and Jung was uh, J.B. Priestley. He's a, a British writer who is not as well known these days, but in the 20th century, he was very, very popular um, as a playwright and a novelist and an essayist and so on. But he, he wrote quite a, quite a lot about time. And he says, yeah, whenever I'm presented to this in this block universe or everything has happened already and in this kind of simultaneity, I'm only an observer. Whereas my experience of myself is actually, a, I, I have agency. I, I, I can act in the world. And tying the two together, dreams and time, one of the examples of this that Priestley um, mentions in a few of his books is that um, there's a woman who dreamed that uh, she was camping <clears throat> and she had her infant child with her and she needed to wash some things and she went from her tent with the infant child down to the river to, you know, whatever scrub, whatever she had to wash. She forgot the soap. And in the dream, she put the child down on the grass, went back to get the soap, came back and the child had fallen into the river and drowned. So upsetting dream. Sometime later, she found herself, she was camping. She was at the river. She did need to wash some things. She had the infant child with her. She went to the river. She forgot the soap. This time she remembered the dream took the infant child with her back to get the soap. So was that not really precognitive because the child didn't drown? Well, one would hope that one would need less severe proof <laughs> than, than a drowning baby. But she did change things. So there's a level, and this goes back to uh, Dunn. Uh, and Priestley says, we don't need Dunn's infinite regress, which is just kind of a, a horror, a metaphysical horror, because you, eventually you have to come to the un, unmoved mover you know, in some way. All you need is the three times. There's the everyday time, tick-tock time. There's the time in the dream world where we hover above and it's a mixture of past and future. And then there's this third level time of observer three, which we can act. We have agency, we're, we're free. And then he blends, Priestley blends that in with Uspensky. And Uspensky had this notion of a six-dimensional time where we have you know, three dimensions of space, fourth dimension, regular time. Fifth dimension is something called not the not the band, <laughs> the singers from the the sixties, but it was um, uh, the eternal recurrence where each moment in time, like we're having this conversation now, recurs eternally. You know, and is that kind of eternal present? Is that kind of block universe? Is that kind? But there's another level. There's a sixth dimension above that in which you know we can act. The the sixth dimension is made up of all the other possibilities that didn't take place at that time because every time we act in a certain way we we actualize those possibilities at the expense of all the others that could have happened another point you raise which i think is really crucial is that there are cultures that view time completely differently and uh, one of the examples you raise is uh, native americans yeah i talk about um, edward hall's book the dance of time and he was an anthropologist who spent quite a bit of time with the Hopi uh, Indians. And he talks about how after he, he was with them for some amount of time, he can't seem to get away from you the word time quite a bit, that his own sense of time changed. And he, you know, Western, white, you know, whatever, mid-Atlantic, you know, Atlantic, European, uh, American, European, you know, background. So he had the straight on Newtonian sense of time, you know, trying to get as much done, saving time every day, you know, whatever, being on time and all that. And um, he talks about, at one point, he had to go with some of his, you know, colleagues or uh, uh, people at, uh, there, and they had to transport some horses from one bit to another bit. I forget exactly how far they had to go. It was a, a couple hundred miles or something. It was qu quite a long ride, but they, they had they could only go at a certain speed. They didn't want to tire out the horses. So they didn't, you know, it wasn't galloping away. It was, you know, whatever, a gentle trot. And it said it over a few days, his whole sense of time and the environment changed because it wasn't just hurtling past on the, on the motorway, you know, in your car, or it wasn't galloping off, you know, fast on the horse. It was just sort of 
Doom, ba doom, ba doom, ba doom. Uh, but he said he sort of they passed this mountain and he saw it at all these different kind of angles, you know, at, at different times. And I say to my, myself, I had a similar experience. Nothing, nothing quite as dramatic as, as riding the horse. But um, I, I know there were there were when I lived in Los Angeles many years ago, and um, at some point I went up to the Sequoias, up to Northern California, <clears throat> and I rented a cabin. I was going to spend a week up in the sequoias. There's these, you know, obviously gigantic ancient trees that have been there for thousands of years, and they have their own time themselves. But I, I wanted to get away from the city, but I had brought the city with me, as it were, because it took me about three days to adjust to being in that environment, just like it took Hall about three days to adjust, you know, being on the prairie and all that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, there's different cultures, what we call them indigenous or native or whatever, or, you know, we used to say primitive and primitive is not necessarily a bad word. It means primal. It means it means like primary. It means first. It means initial. It doesn't necessarily. Again, this is we we've come to understand it as mean oh primitive means whatever. It's some um, you know not as good as us moderns, but it actually means the, the first. It means the prime. Um, and so yeah, I mean so they have a different sense of time than than we do. They don't have this Newtonian sense of time. And you also talk about sacred time. Well, that's um, Musa Eliade uh, and uh, the myth of the eternal return, which is not Uspensky's eternal or Nietzsche's eternal return, which is us having this conversation, you know, many times already. But it's the notion of this, this again, this primal time, the first time, the, the time when the first mythic events took place, the foundational events of, of the culture. And these are what holidays are supposed to be about, holy days. You know, holidays are holy days. Um, in the West, they're hollow days <laughs> in ways because the, the holiness of the holidays have been kind of hollowed out and they're basically excuses for us to have three-day weekends and to have sales or something like that. But, you know, in cultures in which the relig religion is still felt very strongly, and I'm not saying there aren't still people in the West who do feel their culture very strongly, um, these days, these times, or they kind of punch a hole in the everyday world, the everyday time, and reintroduce this initiatory, initial primary moment, which is sacred time. It's, it's outside of that. It's, it's, it partakes for, paradoxically, we have to talk about it in terms of time, it partakes for a certain amount of time of this timelessness. Um, and that's the essence of all, I would say, mystical experiences or religion or the sacred or ritual. Ritual, in some way, is supposed to remind us of something outside of getting and spending, you know, uh, man does not live by bread alone. It, we, we live by these other things, these other elements and ingredients, and they come to us during these sacred moments. One of the people you quote, and it seems as if we're kind of back to him, is uh, St. Augustine, who, who said, uh, if you ask me about time, I can't tell you what it is. If you don't ask me, I think I know. Yeah. Yeah. He was asked, what is time? And he said, if you don't ask the question, I know the answer. So I say time is one of these things. Um, I'm forgetting the quote, because uh, I, 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 I say, you know, uh, every one of us, we start thinking about time and it's like, oh, I can't get my head around it. It's like, you know, what is it? You know, what does it mean and all that? But the philosophers, they should be able to grab it. But if you start, if you look up any history of philosophy, the notion of time, there's, you know, a plethora of different arguments. There's quite a few where, no, 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 it doesn't exist. No, absolutely, it does exist. There's no, you know, there's famous stories of, oh, time doesn't exist, and somebody pulls out their watch. Yes, but what's that? You know, that, that kind of thing. So there's lots of stories like that, but I mean, no one's really nailed it. It's one of these absolute fundamental mysteries, which, I mean, even space itself, where is space? Where's the universe? I mean, where is the, actually, you know, all the, any is we could think of is within the universe in the first place. So it's, these are like Zen koans. It's like this, the universe isn't anywhere because all wares are within it itself. And you start, whoa, that's like, what does that mean? You know, so the same, same thing about time. I mean, time is one of those things, like oh, 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 St. Augustine said, if you don't ask me, we all know what it means. We all know when we're running out of it. We all know when, you know, um, we're late for an appointment or we all know when we've got, oh, I can't wait until I have that, uh, that weekend ahead of me. But you actually, this stuff that you're going to make use of or save, <laughs> as it were, what it actually is. Um, again, we're back to, you know, 
we, we can't say what it is, but it's one of these fundamental things. I mean, Whitehead, again, I, I mentioned it because he's somebody who actually, he developed a whole theory of relativity um, around the same time or a little bit, you know, not too far after Einstein. And even earlier than Einstein, the philosopher Leibniz, the German philosopher Leibniz, he developed a notion of relativity. And Leibniz and Whitehead, although very different, they both agreed that without process, without things happening, you can't have any notion of time. If you had an action, if you just, again, go back to this notion of a static universe, nothing is moving. I mean, you wouldn't have any sense of time whatsoever. You know, it just would be, you know, you, 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 even if it's you looking at the static thing, you're not in that static picture, you know, picture, you wouldn't be looking at it. You know, you're, you're an outs observer outside in, in, in still in a temporal dimension, looking at something that's static. So we, we can't really understand anything like that. Um, and so, um, but what Whitehead said is like, time is one of these things that we, we, we they're one of these imponderables that we can't explain uh, without resorting to equally imponderable sorts of ideas, you know, you can't, you, you're going to have to point to something else. And it's just, so we're left as Plato, you know, the father of philosophy, uh, Western philosophy and Whitehead himself said, you know, when Plato reached one of these things, he, he, he put aside the dialectic and, and he reached for myth. So he said like, you know, uh, eternity is in love with the production of time. And he was trying to wed these things. And Whitehead himself said that all the Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato and he himself, in these massive books like Process and Reality, which is, you know, one of the great unread works of 20th century philosophy, um, um, and others that are more readable. But he tries to do the same thing that, that Plato did, was bring together this notion of, you know, this, the static perfection, but also our felt experience of things changing. And he, he developed what he called process philosophy. Well, you earlier told the joke about God calling it a day after creating the universe. Uh, I, I, one joke that I remember is, uh, why did God create time? And the answer is to keep everything from happening all at once. <laughs> Our two brains, actually. One brain sees everything happening all at once, takes it all in in the big picture. It's a bit fuzzy not absolutely clear because it is a big kind of picture, but it, it gives that sense of immediate meaning, you know, and connection. And the other pinpoints things, you know, with, with this precision accuracy at the expense of that sense of connection and all that. And it's when the two come together, I would say is when we have those kinds of, you know, truly kind of mystical experiences uh, and they don't last for too, for too long. Um, mostly because we, we are, here in this world and we have to kind of get on, you know, with things we do have to, although, you know, we're no longer trouble. I mean, we have, we, <laughs> because we're so successful, we're dealing with the initial problems of just living. And, and uh, I'm talking about the history of civilization going back, you know, thousands of years, we've created all these other problems. Um, you know, in a way it sounds ridiculous, but we should congratulate ourselves that the problems that we really have to deal with are ones that we've created ourselves and successfully, you know, you know, you know uh, be, being so good at, <laughs> at creating civilization. So, but, you know, uh, we, we, we can, you know, deal with those problems and then we can direct our minds, which I think one of the things we need to do to these deeper kind of questions that, that don't deal with the TikTok kind of time, don't deal with this kind of precision sort of thing, but, but deal with this kind of wider kind of broader process sort of uh, way, way of seeing things. And, um, I mean, at the same time, we shouldn't just give up sequential thought and all that. It's very, you know, uh, I mean, think about reading a book, you know, you, you can read some experimental fiction where, yeah, it's all kind of jumbled together. But it, it, I don't know about you. I know my taste. I, I can't read too much of that. And I want, a, you know, a narrative from beginning, middle and end. Or think about a piece of music. You know, there's a certain satisfaction in, in the old Sonata Allegro form where there's theme variation and it goes through troubles and it comes back in your home. So whether that's Western or not, I know for myself, there's a certain sense of gratification where, I mean, I, I can listen to more experimental music, but it doesn't have the journey sense. It's more like, or it's a, it's a, you're kind of going through landscape, you know, uh, as it were, but it's not necessarily, uh, you start here and you end there. It's kind of like you can get off the train at any point kind of thing. So um, I'm just putting a pitch in because, because we've been for such, such a long time in the left Newtonian sequential logical literary, you know, 
um, literacy look, way of looking at things that we had a reaction against that to simultaneity and more image based. The internet was supposed to be that. The internet is something that goes against time. You know, you know, I mean, I, I didn't get to mention him in this book, but Gene Gebser, who's somebody, a philosopher I've talked about in other books, uh, he died in the early 70s, but he, he believed that um, what we would be experiencing generations after him was something that he called the eruption of time. And this was the notion that time itself was going to become more and more something that was part of our everyday kind of experience in, in ways different than it was already. And one of the things I think that <clears throat> might be evidence that Gebser was right about this was the whole thing about sort of, um, well, it was TiVo back in the day. I don't know what it's called now, you know, but the, or, or whatever, the streaming, variety of different streaming you know, services and podcasts where, um, again, I... When I was a kid, when I was growing up, if I wanted to watch something on television, I had to be home at a certain, or in front of a TV, at a certain place at a certain time. Whereas now, I can be anywhere, anytime, on my phone or anything, watching anything, watching those shows. I used to have to be at home at a certain. So, time in that sense is not a is not a is not a thing anymore. And this is something that's come up in conversations with some uh, other people I've talked with about this. Where it, that slightly getting into time travel because we're talking about precognition, but then the whole notion of this being the present. Well, I just have to, I'm here now, so this is why this is the present. But the, when, when is the present? If you know, this video is the perfect example of uh, what you're talking about today for you and me is February 23rd. But people will be watching this video and, in a sense, experiencing the simultaneity of our conversation uh, on a variety of other dates. I refer to a title of a book by H.G. Wells called The Conquest of Time, which is one of Wells' sort of future histories where, in a sense, the conquest of time and meaning, you know, he was all for this, this early modern world with suddenly the speed and you know, communication across vast distances, which we take for granted, but in the early 20th century was, was remarkable and new and breathless. So he meant that, that we were conquering time, but it was actually, I, I say it was actually time conquered us more than the other way around. Um, but, you know, um, yeah, there is this kind of sense where time seems to be increasingly, you know, something that's, I don't know. It's it's uh, we're fascinated with time travel. I mean, it's I, I mean, in a way, uh, if metaphorically, if you go online or Netflix or whatever it is on these streaming things and you throw a rock in any direction, you'll hit a time travel program. So we're somehow fascinated with this. Um, and, you know, what does that mean? Is it just a fad or does it is it more emphasis, evidence that Gebser was right about this kind of thing where time becoming, you know, a very, very strange um, thing for us, you know? I mean, one, I, I don't know if I mentioned, I said earlier, we, we, we very rarely do you have those kind of clocks anymore. You have just that, you know. And I also wonder, can the digital clocks be fast? I, I always thought they, if they must be all to the same thing, but I have one here that I keep having to set because it, <laughs> <laughs> it seems to go two minutes ahead of the BBC or whatever's on my phone. And I keep, I keep trying to get it. I want to get a thing and then see, can they be fast? I mean, I, 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 I don't know. Maybe I'm giving them too much credit to think that they shouldn't, that shouldn't happen, but I don't know. Well, there are different kinds of digital clocks, I believe. Uh, the, the other interesting thing is uh, when it comes down to the brain and the nervous system, we have a sense of the present moment. And uh, neurologists will say that for human beings, the present moment is typically around, let's say, a fifth of a second. Uh, uh, but for other conscious beings, it might be very different. It might be the case that uh, a, um, a conscious entity somewhere in the universe has a present moment might be uh, what we call a hundred years. I mean, this is what the old, you know, religion, what was that? I don't know. You know, a thousand years is but a moment in the eyes of the Lord and things of that sort. Uh, I mean, yeah, again, you know, we... Yeah, again, the present. The pre I mean, the present, you can say, is a... Well, I'll, 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 I'll kind of paraphrase Nietzsche here. Nietzsche, um, who wrote about time quite a bit, the notion of the eternal recurrence and all that. And um, But he said, you know, he, he said truth is an error, a kind of error that a certain species can't live without. 
So I would say the present might be a kind of error that a certain living things, certain living things can't. I mean, what, what kind of present does a snail have? I mean, just, I mean, tr- I mean, I, I, in some way, philosophers say, oh, well, you can never know what a snail might think. But just use your imagination and kind of, you know, wonder what might it be. Would it, would it be in the same way the present is, is for us? I mean, we have a present, but we have, you can't have a present unless you have a notion of the past or the future. Uh, again, I mean, the present is defined by being this <laughs> infinitely narrow and thin barrier, a membrane that the past, the future passes through it in order to become the past. So, but you have to have some, the, so yeah, as you said, a fifth of a second. So it kind of, I, so actually 2.5 either way, you know, 2. 2.5 in the future, 2.5 in the past, and we're, and we're there. I mean, you know, maybe it's some, maybe, you know, you could spread it out. I mean, they're, they're all those, kind, I mean, one of the things I talk about in the book is that um, there are ways in which you can slow down your sense of time. Um, I mentioned this experiment that I, I, I found in Itzhak Bentov's book, um, Stalking the Wild Pendulum, where he says, you know, again, you have to take an old fashioned clock, an old TikTok kind of clock, um, and you look at it. And usually, you know, we can, we, we, we can see the second hand move. We just usually can't see the minute hand move. And we certainly don't see the hour hand move. But in this experiment, you close your eyes and you think of some wonderful place You're on the beach. It's sunny. You know, the, the waves are lapping. You can feel the warmth of the sun. It's a fantastic, wonderful place. So you're very, very relaxed or, or some, something similar, whatever it might be, some wonderful place. And you're in that, and then you sort of there for a bit, but then you open your eyes and just casually, as if you just glanced at it, look at the watch. And what should happen, and it's, it's happened to me when I've done this, is that suddenly you can see the second hand, it, you can see it hover over the space, you know, where before it would just kind of move in a, you know, sort of, you know, continuous kind of motion, but you can see the actual, it's stuff. And then you can see the minute hand move glacially but you can see the minute move and i would think with even you know more concentration you could see the hour him now we don't need to do that you know there's, so there's no reason why you know we should be able to do that but it's something that we, we could do and there's all these sorts of things that we have the ability to do i mean it's time memory consciousness all of that stuff i mean um it's not the same i mean one of the things that i, I say talking in the book is some years ago i had an operation on uh, my knee and um I was out, you know, hobbling along <laughs> on my crutches uh, 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 you know, to get, you know, a bit of air. And what used to take whatever, 10 minutes, you know, took me a half hour or an hour or something. But what I noticed that I, ha- I had to concentrate on each step I took and each step was very slow because if I slipped into usual automatic, habitual kind of motion, I, I would move too quickly and I, it was very painful. But what I found was I was looking down and I, I, I was seeing all the flecks from the mica, all the sparkle, which is there all the time, but, in, you know, in the pavement. So there's all this kind of flecks of mica in, 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 the, uh, in the pavement that, are, you know, the sunlight's reflected in. And they're there all the time. I don't have the time or the patience to see them all the time, but I was forced to slow down. So um, there are other kind of things like that. And, and medita- oh, meditation does that, you know, and we, we, we decide to have a sense that we, we know we can do that. So we have a more, we have a greater command over our sense of time or, or sense of duration or in, internal sense of time than, um, than we know. Well, you've written extensively on the imagination, and it certainly does seem that while the body is limited uh, pretty strictly to linear time, we go from birth to death, and uh, normally on our tombstones, there's the you know the year <laughs> of the birth and the year of the death is 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 published, but in the realm. <laughs> in the realm of the imagination, it does seem that we we have the uh, possibility of having a, a, I will call it a conscious experience of time in a very different way. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, again, I, I talk about time travel in the book, and I, I say it seems to me there's some logical problems in physical time travel, like the, the original H.G. Wells, the time traveler, who has a machine who the machine moves through this medium called the fourth dimension, which is, which is the stuff time. Um, I mean, I mean, one of the logical problems was that is if 
time travel is ever possible, it was always possible, right? Because there's, again, it gets back to there's no, it doesn't matter what the present in it is anymore because you can travel to time. So if you go back into the past, you're in the present because it's the present because you're there, but it's the past. And if you go into the future. So when, when was time travel discovered or invented doesn't mean anything um, because there is no when anymore. You know, you, 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 you can move at any point. Or, or also, how long does it take to travel in time? If it's not instantaneous, it takes a certain amount of time to travel in time as well. And then there's another, there, there you are, you're in this, uh, you're in Dunn's other time. So you're in the time machine. Wells is in time one moving through his time machine, but another person is on the banks of time one looking at Wells doing that and saying, oh, well, let's see, it takes about 15 minutes to go 5,000 years in the past, right? <laughs> but he, yeah. and he's, that, that observer is in time as well. And he could make a time machine. But you know what I mean? So you get to the infinite regress. So unless it's instantaneous, it, unless it's like the, the you know, uh, the particles that do the famous quantum leap, which is basically traveling, arriving without traveling. They're all Taoists, the, the particles. They arrive without traveling. You know, they, they, you know, they go from one ring to the other without actually moving. So unless time travels like that, then you're still stuck with an, another level of time and so on and so on. But in the mind... And the imagination, which, again, it's not just your imagination, which is make-believe, it's make-real, actually. Imagination is the faculty we have to grasp realities that are not immediately present. <clears throat> and past realities are one of those, you know. And I talk about, well, there's the famous examples of the ladies, the Oxford ladies, um, uh, uh, Madame Jourdain uh, and Moberly, who in the uh, late 1890s were visiting... Um, Versailles. And they suddenly found themselves back into the time of uh, Marie Antoinette. And they wrote, you know, they, they compared notes and all this kind of thing. And they, at different times, they went back individually and had similar experiences. And they actually met people who lived in the area who said, oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, and although there have been attempts to um, explain it in terms of people having fancy dress parties around that time, actually, the, the dates for that to have happened were, were not the same. And so you know, unless you want to say they made it up, but there's no reason to actually think they would do that. And, um, and but more famously, there's the, or, or I should say, more impressive, um, or the experiences of Arnold Toynbee. And I mentioned him in the other talk where he had these, you know, time slips. But I mean, you know, I, I, I think we can do that. Um, one of the, I mean, I, Wells wrote another time, he, he wrote a few time travel books, you know, different, you know, there's a sleeper wakes where someone sleeps like, Rumpelstiltskin for ages and wakes up in the future. But there's another one called The Shape of Things to Come. And again, we mentioned that one in the other talk too, where the character in that dreams dreams the future. So it's this, we, I think we have this capacity to actually time travel in the imagination, but it's not just make-believe imagination. We, I mean, it's it, it, it's hard not to talk about things I talked about in, 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 the, in the, other, the other talk as well, but there's the whole notion that in a way, Things in the world out out there around us carry a record of of of, of their history uh, with them. Um, you know, there's the paranormal faculty known as psychometry, where you're able to pick up something and know, you know, ah, oh, this this was a rock from you know some volcanic explosion in Krakatoa or whatever it might be, uh, and so on, a variety of different things like that. Um, and uh, yeah, other ways in which that that's possible, dowsing or the work of T. C. Lethbridge with with pendulums where he, he came to understand that he was able to find what he called different rates um, for different substances. Uh, rate was the length of the, the string that the pendulum was at, but also the number of times that it, it, it spun around. But not only could would it respond to substances, which we you know about dowsing, you could douse for water, you could find coins and historical artifacts and he was an archaeologist so initially all this tied into his, his search for you know artifacts but it would respond to abstract ideas but he came to the understanding that the, the actual the notion of time had a certain limit and then uh, th there seemed to be a kind of what he called this kind of realm of, uh, it, it, he mapped all this out on the spiral i can't go into detail about it but he called about the sec the second the next whirl of the spiral which was some realm that it went into which was a timeless kind of realm which is this kind of simultaneity where everything was available 
from all of the various accounts, philosophies, and experiences that we're talking about, including your own precognitive dreams, which we discussed at length in the previous interview, it would seem to me that we are embedded in a an environment where there are many different, I'm going to call them time waves, from di different frequencies of time waves interpenetrating us constantly so that Time is very, very far from the, the Newtonian view, actually. And when you pay attention to people's conscious experiences, you have to come up with other models, uh, as Henri Bergson did. There's nothing wrong with the Newtonian thing. It works. You know, I mean, you know, well, um, you know I, I, I'm glad, <laughs> you know, whatever, uh, something happens when I'm, you know, the train is there at the time I'm, it's supposed to be. And all that. So, but, you know, it's not. That's not the only way for us to experience time. And we, we even we talk about, you know, what do they call it? Downtime, you know, now or something. You know? and, and, but even that, you know, it's sort of like you have to put aside a certain amount of time in order to lose your sense of time. Because, I mean, one of the, you know, the ways when we talk about relax, that, that means that we no longer have this driven sense of having to get things done and all that. And sadly, you know, you know we're, we're driven to use, you know, um, substances, whatever it might be. Uh, I mean, wine, wine is one of the great, you know, time, um, uh, how should we say it, uh, means of slowing down time. I, I, I quote um, the French poet Baudelaire, and he says, if you would not be a martyr of time, be drunk. You know, and even back then, and this is 18... 50s or something so even then which is still relatively early but this is like the you know industrial beginning of the industrial revolution all that so that pressure 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 all that kind of thing um but no i, I think yeah there's all different times because i would say there's all it's time is a factor of our consciousness you know so our consciousness diff differs and so time would differ as well Gary Lockman, once again, a very amazing, erudite, uh, multi-layered uh, conversation about a, a topic which has mystified people uh, from the, the very beginnings of, of the discussion for thousands of, of years. <laughs> yeah, from the beginning of time. <laughs> I, I suspect they'll be mystified still, and that, that's good. We should, be, we should be mystified by these things. They're mysteries, and they should just prompt us to keep thinking about them. Well, Gary, once again, thank you so much for being with me today. My pleasure. Thank you, Jeffrey. Take care. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us.